Well, I'm Denise Side, and I'm the president of Logic of English. And today I'm really excited to share with you about reading because reading has become a passion for me and helping children learn how to read. As we begin this conversation, though, I want everyone in the room to think about how you learned how to read because I have a theory about this, and I'll share it in a minute. So did you learn to read at home? Because some kids learn to read before they ever go to school. They almost pick it up naturally at home. Or do you remember learning to read in the classroom? Do you remember maybe Dick and Jane books and learning to read with those? Or do you remember learning the ABCs? Or do you remember being successful with reading? I know that most educators, when they reflect back on their own education with reading, they say, I'm not really sure how I learned to read. It just happened for me. And so this is something that most people who go into the fields of education are able to think, I was one of those kids that was really successful in school, and that's why I went into education, because I loved it. I loved it right from the time I was in school. But that is not the reality for a majority of our students, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. However, what I want us to think about is what does reading bring to us? What are the aspects that reading enhances in our lives? We learn facts and details. We learn new perspectives. We're able to follow directions. We're able to be more creative when we read. We are able to experience a different time and place. We're able to look from the viewpoint of another person. We're able to explore new ideas, understand different cultures, read a good story, relax. There are so many avenues that reading enriches our lives. And I would say that reading is part of learning and growing. It's, it's a huge part of who we are when we're literate. These are the literacy statistics in South Carolina, and they're no surprise to anyone in this room. But what I want to point out is something um, about them, just a few things, because I've been thinking a great deal about the statistics in our nation as well as in your state. So first of all, um, this is according to the National Reading Panel for 2000, or to the nation's report card for 2013. And if we look at it carefully, it's 72% of fourth graders who are not proficient. And what I want to point out in that, in this room is this. We, if you're highly literate, fall into the minority. A majority of students struggle with reading education. And I think for me, that was an absolute surprise. And this is true in the nation, too. A majority of people in our country struggle in some way with literacy. And so I want to think about what this has looked like through the decades. In South Carolina, this was 10 years ago, it was 75%. 20 years ago, it was 80%. And so South Carolina is making progress, right? You are. You've changed the statistics by 8%. But what I want to propose today is a way to flip these statistics. Instead of inching them, I want to say maybe there's a way that we can make 80% of the students in the state so they're strong in literacy. And hopefully, you'll catch a vision with me of what this might look like. Now, before we do that, I want to talk about some of the objections that people raise. And I looked at your census data. One of the big ones that is raised in Minnesota is the ELL population, the number of non, um, children in our schools who come from homes where English is not the first language. But in um, South Carolina, according to your census data, it was 7% of households that do not speak English as their first language. So that does not explain 72% of students struggling with reading. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a factor. It is a factor. I was an ESL teacher, so if you have a lot of ESL students in your district, obviously this is an issue that you need to deal with in a particular way. Um, the other issue that comes to me a lot is whenever I bring up reading education, one of the first things people say to me is, this is an issue of poverty. So I pulled up the poverty statistics, again from your census data. 23% of children in South Carolina live below the federal poverty line. So that doesn't even come close to explaining 72% of children in fourth grade reading below grade level. Now, if I look at what the federal poverty line is at like 24,000, I think if I'm living on 27,000 with a family, I'm still in poverty, right? I mean, I couldn't do it. So I decided, well, let's look at home ownership because if you own your own home, you have some level of financial stability. 
Well, 69% of households in South Carolina own their own home. And I just want you to look at that in relationship to the number of fourth graders who aren't proficient. And I guess what I want us to do is I want us to break out of the mold that we can't do this and begin to think in a new way that we can. I also want us to think about the fact that even though poverty is not the best predictor of how well our students are going to do in reading, reading is a very good predictor if our students are going to be in poverty. So 43% of adults on welfare in our nation read at the lowest levels of literacy. Only 7% of adults who read at the highest levels of literacy are in poverty. So we have a very good correlation going from can an adult read to are they in poverty. However, poverty rates do not do a good job at predicting if our students are going to succeed in reading. So I also found this as I was looking, and this was probably the tightest correlation I could find. If you'll notice, um, there are 28% or so of students, um, actually, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. This is high school graduation rates. 78% of South Carolina adults have graduated from high school. So most of your parents have a high school degree, and this was what I was referring to before. Uh, this is the tightest correlation I could find. Check this out. There are 25% of adults in your state with a high school or with a college degree. Do you notice how that corresponds almost perfectly to the number of students who read at or above grade level? And I think if you were to try to match this up even more closely based on what years they graduated and things, you might find an even tighter correlation. So literacy is a huge part of our success in life, our ability to um, earn and to provide for our families, and in our sense of ourselves. So one of the missions that I really believe that I have been given is to become a voice for the people who struggle. And I want to emphasize, this is a majority. And when I speak and I give my Logic of English presentation, I often have this rush of people coming forward telling me their stories. And many of these people are well-educated, many of them are not, and they pour out their hearts because for the first time I think they feel the freedom to talk about what they've been feeling and thinking all these years. So during this presentation I'm going to share some of their stories with you so you can get inside their minds and their hearts. Um, the first story I have actually just came to me this week, and it was a mother, and this is what she said. My son is almost eight, and before Logic of English, I asked him if he would like to write a letter to his dad. We are divorced parents. My son fell apart and cried with a broken heart. All he could get out to me when I asked him why he was so upset was, I'm too stupid to know how to write anything, and no one will ever understand what it says. Well, I was a gifted reader as a child, so I had no idea how my son felt. But hearing your child call himself stupid is one of the most devastating things as a parent. These days, however, he makes me text pictures of his handwriting for his dad to see as soon as we finish every lesson. His confidence is, is through the roof, and he's proud of his work. So this was a very short period of time of transition in this child's life, but the message that I'm stupid is what I've heard again and again and again when a child fails to learn to read. They internalize that this is about them and it's about something that they have done wrong. So what we've done in the past is I've looked at literacy to try to fix this and we have good intentions, trust me. I think we are all together trying to solve literacy. But what I see most districts and most communities doing is getting lots of volunteers to listen to kids read. And what I hear kids and what I hear adults telling me who struggled is when that volunteer listened to me read and I didn't know how to read, I just felt more stupid because I just struggled more and more. And what I hear volunteers saying is that sometimes it's very, very joyful and they're able to you know, help that child. And other times they feel like they're just giving those kids those words when they're stumbling and they're not sure how to help them. So. The other thing I see uh, us doing as a society and as a culture is saying, well, one of the issues is kids don't have enough books. We just need to surround them with books. Let's give them more books. And I agree. We need to surround kids with books because hopefully we'll spark a desire to learn to read. But I don't think that this is solving our problem fast enough. 
And so keep doing these things. We need volunteers to listen to kids read. We need books. I'm hopefully going to cast a vision for you about how to do this a little differently, though. Okay? Before we do that, I want to think about education as a whole, and I want to draw a few analogies to help us dig deeper. So I like to think about education as a tree. It's a very organic process, and it grows like a tree. And the branches of this tree represent the knowledge that we have. And as we grow, we have more books and more subjects that we can open. And we grow as people. But that top of that tree cannot exist without the trunk and without the roots. And something that surprised me, um, this is from the University of Minnesota agricultural page, is that the, tr the roots of a healthy tree are larger than the top of the tree. And I think there's something we can learn about that when it comes to reading education, because we often want to jump to reading and comprehending, to opening books, to getting kids to, to, to read and do what we do with books when we're literate. But we forget about growing roots. Another way to look at this is as if you're building a foundation. And I believe that language arts in your native language or in whatever language you're communicating in is the foundation for all of your education. It's how we communicate about every other subject. So if you want to build a house, you need to build a foundation like this. But if you build a foundation like this, guess what you can do? You can add story after story after story, and you don't have to truncate that building because you have the support. So with reading education, the research has really clearly shown that there are five strands. It begins with phonemic awareness. I'm going to interlace fluency in throughout these, and we'll come back to why I do it this way. There's systematic phonics, more fluency, comprehension skills, vocabulary, and there is then reading to comprehend, which is our goal, right? Everybody's goal is that children pick up books, they read, they comprehend them, and they can engage in the great dialogue that has been happening through literature. And this is uh, just a representation for you of how this comes together. So all of our education, all the other subjects, are really built on our abilities to do these other things. So let's go ahead and start looking at each of these pieces. Phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness is the understanding that words are comprised of sounds. Now, this sounds very, very simple, and it might seem very obvious to us as educators. But I'm going to tell you a story about a gentleman who is a retired engineer from 3M, and he's the mayor in his city in Wisconsin right now, because it's not obvious to everyone. So this is Jack, and Jack uh, was at a convention with me, and he picked up a cup, copy of the book, Uncovering the Logic of English. And Jack brought it up to his hotel room, and the next day he came back and he said, Denise, I have to tell you this book about English. I was crying about it all night in my hotel room. And this is not an uncommon response, surprisingly, about this book about English. And he said, this is why. He said, when I was a child, my teachers, they told me about the ABCs and the sounds, but there were so many exceptions that they also taught me all those sight words. And he said, those sounds didn't make any sense to me, so I just thought reading was about words. And my whole life, I have been trying to read and spell with words, and my whole life, I have struggled with reading and spelling. And then he starts crying again, and he said, for the first time, I discovered there's nothing wrong with me. And the code really makes sense to me after reading this book. And he went on and he said, you know what? Every year I, I tutor a fourth grade boy who's struggling in school. And as I was reading this book, I made this discovery. And he said, the discovery I made is that all of these boys are gearheads like me. And all of them are struggling with reading because they're not being taught in a way that makes sense to them. Now, Jack, on a fundamental level, was missing phonemic awareness. He didn't understand that words are made of sounds and that those sounds can be rearranged and represented. And he was a lucky one, right? Because despite the fact that he struggled, he managed to, to go through college and to have a successful career. So how does Foundations, the program that we're talking about, deal with phonemic awareness? And I want to first say that many, many curriculums say that they teach phonemic awareness. 
And what they do is they teach rhyming. And they have kids listen to stories that rhyme. But rhyming is a very complex skill. Because if you rhyme, you have to think, what is the last syllable of that word? Where's the vowel? Where's the last consonant? How do I divide it? I mean, it's not an easy task. It is probably the highest level of phonemic awareness you can have. So in our program, we start in a very different way. We start by developing a kinesthetic awareness of sounds. And kids love this. We do things like this, and you can try it with me. We'll say a sound like p. Go ahead and say p. And we'll say, what is our lips doing when we say p? Hmm, they're popping, they're coming together, and I'll have them put their hand up. Do you feel the air coming out? They're developing an awareness that sounds are made by the different ways they shape their mouth. And I'll say, let's compare it to b, b. And I'll say, what are, what's the same? And you'll feel that p, b. My lips are in the same position. Why do they sound different? And usually they'll experiment, and then I'll say, put your hand on your throat. P, b. Oh, for b, it's voiced. Now, this seems like an easy activity, but it's amazing how little kids light up. I uh, volunteered in my local elementary school recently to actually introduce kids to a kinesthetic awareness of sounds in a first grade classroom as a demonstration for the teachers. And for the rest of the presentation, these little kids were like, this sound is voiced too, and that one. And did you hear that? because they were learning something about language and they were immediately beginning to apply it. After they develop uh, a kinesthetic awareness of sounds, which really only takes a couple lessons, one or two or three, then we begin to do activities like this. And we always do it through games. I would say something like, all right, I'm going to unglue a word and then I want you to do it. St, a, n, d, and they would Stand, j, uh, m, p, and they would jump. Now, you'll notice in the teacher's manuals, this is all laid out for the teacher, tells them exact words, you can create other words, but the kids get up, they're moving, they're practicing now the skill of blending, but without actually having the print in front of them. They are developing phonemic awareness at the most basic levels. And then it grows. We'll start to identify initial sounds and medial sounds and final sounds, many of the things we're used to thinking about when we think about phonemic awareness, and rhyming. And so every lesson will include these sorts of skills. Now, when it comes to volunteers, they're laid out. Uh, I laid out, by the way, in your folder, uh, overall proposal for the pilot study. Um, and I would propose that we have a volunteer come in each day, if possible, if there's one classroom, or at least three days a week. So if you have a child who's absent and missed this lesson, a volunteer is very capable of reading through the lesson and repeating it. Or if you have a child who's struggling with phonemic awareness because some kids get it faster than others, a volunteer can come in and replay the games. And trust me, the kids are already begging to play the games. So if you have a, a chance to take a couple kids aside who need more practice, they're going to want to play those games, and the volunteer can easily be successful at these activities. Now, the next step, we're going to skip fluency for a minute and talk about systematic phonics. And let's talk about a definition for phonics, because I believe phonics is kind of where the rub comes. So, Phonics at its basic level is a written code which translates sounds into a visual image. And in some languages, this is a beautiful thing. Now, if you think about it, phonics is where the heart of the reading war has been, right? For the last, what, 80, 100 years, whatever it's been. And why? If we lived in Eastern Europe, where there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between sounds and letters, I can promise you there would be no debate about phonics. Do you know why? Because in Eastern Europe, when they teach those kids one sound, one letter, in second grade, the kids decode and spell at the same level as college students. Wouldn't that be beautiful? We don't have a language like that, do we? <laughs> so instead, we have this problem called English, and it's a beast. And it's a beast partly because it's the largest language in the history of the world. Did you know that? 
we have two million words, and maybe it's two million and one with the word selfie that just came out this year. <laughs> it's growing, right? And the average adult knows 40 to 60,000 words. A well-educated adult knows 200,000 words. By the way, 200,000 words are as many words are as thought to be in the next largest language, which is German. So the adults in English, to become well-educated, have enormous vocabularies. Uh, and did you take note of the huge discrepancy here? The well-educated adult knows more than twice as many words as the average adult. And keep that in mind in um, context of the literacy statistics, too, because a majority of our adults fall into average. So we have this enormous language. And the real big problem really is exceptions, isn't it? Because this is what happens. And I've had so many teachers tell me this sort of story. They teach the alphabet. A says A, B says B, C says K as in cat. They teach a few digraphs, S, H says sh, T, H says th. And then they go to pick up the level one readers. These shouldn't be very hard, right? So we go and we pick up Morris the Moose. Did you know there are 17 concepts on page one not explained by that? So then we go and we maybe pick up um, the fat cat sat on the mat. That looks like it's going to be a phonics reader, right? At least it will be controlled. 17 concepts not explained by the phonics I just taught on page one. Well, let's go to the Bob books. Those were designed to be early readers. Maybe that will help. Four concepts on page one, not explained. And by the way, do you see how short that sentence is? So the problem, by the way, there are 63 new concepts introduced in this book. 63 not explained by the typical phonics. And so that has really led to, I believe, the heart of the debate in reading education. Because 50%, well, depending on the phonics you teach, anywhere from 40 to 60% of words fall into the word as exceptions. And that leaves, if you're average, 20,000. And if you're well-educated, 100,000 words to be memorized by rote. OK, put that in context. If you want to, do you know those little flashcards we use for sight words in, in our elementary schools? If you were to just be average, just average, that stack of flashcards would be as high as a seven-story building for all those exceptions. It's not possible. In fact, research shows that the human memory is limited to approximately 2,000 sight sound symbols. And so we wonder, why are so many of our kids struggling with reading? Now, I believe that sight words were well-intentioned because they're trying to explain something, right? They're trying to explain and give kids the skills they need to read fluently the books that we need and want them to read and that they'll grow by. They can't read Sam Sat forever and grow. So here's what I want to propose. What if the problem is not English? What if it's the way we've been teaching it? What if the problem is not the exceptions, what if it's the rules we've been taught? And by the way, you cannot teach what you do not know. So what if we could make all those exceptions go away? What would happen? Let's just look at some of the oversimplifications we've been taught. How many letters are in the alphabet? 26. How many sounds are there in English? Now, I want to point out, I teach at teachers' union conventions, sometimes packed rooms. It is always dead silent with professional educators. It is just as dead silent with parents. There are 45 sounds in English. What's the problem? 26 letters, 45 sounds. We don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence in English, do we? No, we have a complex phonetic code. There are 74 phonograms and 30 spelling rules. And when you put these 104 tools together, you can explain 98% of English words. Not 50%, 98%. So I ask you, would you rather memorize 200,000 words, or 100,000, or 104 tools to explain them? I call these tools the critical thinking tools of language. Another problem that we have in English is many of us have been told English is a phonetic code 
but we don't understand it's much more complex than that. We have the word please and pleasant, and what is EA doing between please and pleasant? It's saying E and E. But do you notice please and pleasant are related in meaning? Now, someone chose EA, and it actually says three sounds, E, E, A, because in English, when we add prefixes and suffixes, oftentimes the pronunciation of vowels changes. And so this is called morphology. And so English spelling balances out meaning as well as sound. We have the word sign and signature. What do you notice in sign? We have a GN, and that G is silent. And I used to wonder as a kid, who thought to put a G in the word sign? How ridiculous. But what happens in the word signature? Can you hear it? And signal. And then back in design, we can't hear it. So it's there because in derivatives using the same root, it can be heard. How about muscle? I used to wonder, why is that C there? Because English is crazy and stupid, right? No, because what happens in muscular? You can hear it. This is an example of morphology. So English is not just a phonetic language. Some languages are pure phonetics. English is a morphophonemic language, meaning it balances out meaning and sounds when we go to spell those words. And when kids see this, they have tools. So just in summary, English is the largest language in the history of the world with 2 million words. There are 45 sounds and only 26 letters, and it is a morphophonemic code. So how do we teach kids the critical thinking skills that they need for language learning to master this? How do we move away from rote memorization of words to critical thinking about how does language work? And I would argue English is one of the great languages to do this with because when you understand something that's a little more complex, you will have a very easy time learning to read in an Eastern European language because all you'll need to do is learn their alphabet. And I'm going to show you that it will help with the Romance languages and many other languages because you learn how to think, not just about English, but about language. So all of this begins with something called the phonogram. I don't teach letters anymore because 26 letters are inadequate. Rather, I teach phonograms, which are literally sound pictures. And this is a picture of three sounds. It's a picture of the sounds a, a, a. This is a picture of the sound sh. This is a picture of the sound i. And this is a picture of the sound And you'll notice in English, phonograms may have one, two, three, or four letters to represent a sound or multiple sounds. I also de-emphasize letter names. When we come into the classrooms, I like to now teach kids just the sounds. As a culture, we put so much emphasis on this as a D-O-G. Does D-O-G tell you anything about what that is? But if you know this is a D-O-G, you can blend that in together into dog, which are the sounds and the skills that you were gaining from phonemic awareness. Now, <laughs> this little phonogram is the reason I'm in front of you today. So I was taught that this says s, as in sand, sick, list, and hiss. And with all of my background in reading education, I had, count them, twin boys, two of them, who could not then read, could not read words like is or his for two years because they misread it as is and hiss. And trust me, I drilled their sight words. I told them, no, that says is, no, that says his, that is an exception but they still couldn't do it. They're little engineers, by the way. They're computer programmers. They are strong math science kids. And I said it says, so it said s. But what else does it say? It says z. And if you say s and z, you'll notice, go ahead and say them with me, s, z. Do you notice they're in the same position in your mouth? The only difference is one is voiced and one is unvoiced. So for some kids, intuitive kids, kids like me who got reading easily, the approximation was enough. I didn't notice there was a difference. In fact, it took me two years of learning to listening to my boys torture read <laughs> to be able to begin to understand some of what they were struggling with. But this says two sounds, and as soon as I told them that it says two sounds, 
they had no more problem reading these words. It was simple for them. Here's another example that I remember from school. I was taught this as, ch as in chin, choice, and check. However, it also says k as in school, orchid, and Christmas. And what do the poor kids in Charlotte think when they're learning that this is supposed to say ch as in Charlotte? <laughs> really, this says three sounds, doesn't it? Ch, k, and sh. And when we teach them all right from the beginning, we give these kids the tools they need to begin to understand this language. Now, how does this apply to foundations, and how does this apply to tutors coming into our classrooms? So, if you'll notice, uh, when we teach a phonogram, it will tell you, I circled it in red, the sounds. If those are hard for you to read, we actually have a reference chart, which I forgot to bring with me, that actually gives sample words. If that's difficult, there's uncovering, it has samples in there. We also have um, other resources on our website. It will tell the teachers and the tutors exactly which phonograms to introduce together. So here students are learning oi and oi. There's two spellings of it. They will be learning along with the kids. There's a script, and I don't like scripts that teachers are tied to like a slave. That's not the point of a script. The point of a script is that a teacher could read through it and discover something about how to teach the lesson and then go in and do it if they need to with the crutch of the script. And if they feel like they've got it, they can then use that as their model. There's also tons of games because mastering the phonograms is one of the keys to becoming a strong reader and speller. And I should have brought this quote because someone posted it on our Facebook page, I think about two days ago. He was a reading tutor in Iowa and he was just teaching the phonograms, and he actually had the test scores. So if you go out to the Logic of English page on Facebook, you can see this, of some of the students and the transitions they made learning the 74 phonograms. And he said, there is no magic bullet for reading, but if there's one that's close, it's learning all the sounds for the phonograms. Because he was seeing such a huge jump in reading levels as kids simply mastered that. So the way that kids practice, though, is games. Who, what child doesn't like to play Go Fish or other card games to help them master it? Another skill that a tutor can easily do. If there's a child who's not getting as much practice at home or is working memory issues, tutors can easily play games with them to practice these sounds. And some of these games are active. Now, with the flashcards, too, the sounds are on the back, as well as sample words. We have thought of every way to give tutors and teachers' crutches. And what I found was when I was tutoring my own kids who were struggling with reading, this is how I discovered all this, by the way, um, I would look at the backs of flashcards where I'd written the sounds, and actually the kids learned them faster than me because I was unlearning. And they didn't have quite as much to unlearn as I had. So when we give the proper tools, I think everyone can be successful. Now, I'm not sure how to go to this link. Um, another thing that we have on our website, we have a new website coming up very soon, and I just want to show this to you. If that is not enough, we have pages like this where you can, you know, if a tutor or a student or a parent, for that matter, is not sure, they can pull it up and they can... A-A-A. They can hear them, too, samples. So there are a lot of resources that we have available um, to help support everyone in learning this vital part. Okay, we also have, by the way, on our website, free training videos, but we have six hours of um, free teacher training. So if you have tutors who are particularly engaged, our entire one day of professional development is online. So if your tutors want to learn this, or your teachers, it's there for free, and we are expanding this. So the support mechanisms are there for people to master these things. Now, I want to talk about this concept of volunteers. I am particularly excited about this project. I mean, I'm working with a number of projects across the country, but I believe that if we want to radically change literacy in our nation, it cannot just be the experts. We need expert teachers. But it is when volunteers also learn how English really works that they will become agents of change as they go back to their communities, their churches, their children, their grandchildren. And they will be learning. 
both if we do uh, support training beforehand and as they work with the kids with well-designed materials. Now, phonics is not limited to sounds, by the way. There are also spelling rules. And many of us think of spelling rules like this. Use I before E, except after C, and a neighbor in way. Any of you familiar with this one? By the way, these are all the exceptions to the only spelling rule that most Americans know. <laughs> so we don't teach that one. Rather, we teach, once again, what I call principles for critical thinking. So one of them is English words do not end in I, U, V, or J. You might be thinking of some exceptions. Go ahead and ask me at the end. But I want to apply this first. I want to apply this first. We have the multi-letter phonogram A and the multi-letter phonogram A. If I have the word pay, which one will I use at the end? A Y. Why can I not use A I? English words don't end in I. Yes. This is the multi-letter phonogram OI. And this is OI. If I'm trying to spell toy, which one do I use? Why can't I use O Y? English words do not end in I. So we can begin to apply this as we learn our phonograms. Another one of my favorite ones is this one. This phonogram says two sounds. It says k and and I was only taught it says k as in cat, by the way. So I was confused by the rest of the words for, um, I don't know, almost 30 years. <laughs> but let's discover when the C says s as in sent and center. When is it saying s in these words? Before an E, before an I, and before a Y. Sounds like some of you teach this rule, and that's good. But when does it say k as in um, cat, cup, and cut? Before an A, O, or U. And before consonant, as in clap, act, and picnic, or at the end of the word. So the rule is C always softens to when followed by an E, I, or Y. Otherwise, C says K. And this is an important rule, and it works in our language. And one of the reasons it's important is it explains words that many people go, see, English is crazy. Look at the word circus. This word itself is an exception. Is it? No, because it's saying S before the I and K before the U. Now, this rule, I think, is probably one of the most important to teach because it explains more than 10,000 English words where the C says K and more than 8,000 where it says S. And what do you notice about these words where the C is softening to S? Many of these are multisyllable words, aren't they? And I remember sitting in um, science classes and getting a word like lymphocytes and having to remember it like this, L-Y-M-P-H-O, and going, I have to wait for the teacher to pronounce this word because I have no idea how to say it, and English is really, really dumb. And I, somehow I got on just fine. But it would have helped me as a gifted student in language tremendously simply to know how and why these words were spelled this way. Also, many kids plateau at about fourth grade because they can't decode multisyllable words. So as they learn these sorts of rules, they can apply them to larger words. Now, let's also put this to work um, because I think this is also where we see it helping gifted kids or kids who are good at language. Because why do we add a K to picnic to make picnicking? So it doesn't say picnicine. Why do we add a K to mimic to make mimicking? So it doesn't say Mimicing. Why do we add a K to panic to say panicky? So it doesn't say panacea. And the same with garlicky. Now, some of you are good spellers. And some of you, if you think about it and take a good look at garlicky, go, boy, that looks weird. You agree? Yeah, but it's right. And if you knew the rules, you would know why it's right. Because most good spellers go, well, I'll just write it down and it looks right. They have no idea why. They've been memorizing. We need to stop that, and we need to start to teach how to think about it and understand it, because then it applies. Now, here's one of my other favorite examples. Um, we have this silent final E rule, which I think we all teach, cap, cape, pet, pete, rip, ripe, rob, robe. The vowel says its name because of the E. Very, very important to teach. It explains 50% of silent final E words. What's the problem? 50% exceptions. exceptions. But you already know why there's a silent E in have, give, mob, solve, comprehensive. Why? I told you. English words don't end in V. 
Why is there a silent final and true blue value continue construe? English words don't end in U. And that becomes English words do not end in V or U. So add a silent final E. This is the second most common reason for a silent final E. And I, when I saw this picture, I had to buy it because what is this man doing? He is drilling the reading of the sight word have. And he doesn't look happy. The boy doesn't look happy. The boy keeps misreading it probably as have. How many of you have experienced this with kids? And all he needs to do is say English words don't end in V. That's why the E is there. Now, for those of you who don't think this makes a difference, the little bit that I've trained in school districts, even if the districts do not adopt our curriculum, all of those teachers stop teaching have as a sight word, and they begin teaching English words don't end in V. Because teachers are also looking for better, more efficient ways. So these make a difference, and they make a difference immediately in our classrooms. Why is there a silent E in choice, commerce, force, absence, and voice? What would this say? It'd say choik. It's there to make the C say s. The C says s because of the E. This is just three out of nine reasons for a silent final E, just to give you a taste of the power of understanding the language. Now, just to help you also understand the power of the phonograms, this is Ali Gower. And uh, once again, just to help you hear the heart of, a, um, of an adult, Ali is a mixed media artist, and my friend met her on an airplane. And Ali confessed to my friend Katie that she struggled with reading. And in that course of that airplane ride, she described herself as stupid seven times. And she went on to say, she said, I can't even read a recipe. I have to have my daughter read it to me. But Katie gave Allie this copy of this book, Uncovering the Logic of English. And then she called me, and she was so excited. And I was thinking, Katie, are you out of your mind? You gave a book to someone who's functionally illiterate. What are you thinking? Well, Allie, about a month or two later, emailed us and said, I have read my first Nicholas Sparks novel and comprehended it. She took uncovering and the chart and taught herself the phonogram sounds. She used the phonogram sounds to read the book, and then she learned what she had learned, or she used what she had learned to read her first novel, and she was elated. And she said, I was in special education, I went through all these remedial reading classes, and this is the first time I've ever read anything and comprehended it. <coughs> she's since emailed us that she's bought a Kindle and she reads at least five pages a day of poli sci books <laughs> because she really likes political science. So there's hope and there's power. And I'm sharing these stories because this is the voice of the 72%, the people who are struggling. So how do we do this in foundations? The rules are here. Once again, they're detailed out. And I would say that most of your volunteers, hopefully your teacher will have training, but your volunteers will learn alongside the students and they'll get excited about it because they do. And I want to challenge you as a group that good policy can pave the way for change, but in our country too often we think policy is the change. Good policy cannot be the change. Real change only occurs when real people implement real change in their everyday real lives. And once again, I'm so excited that you can get teachers and parents and volunteers and communities together because change will happen when they all work together to learn how the language works. And I really believe this truly begins with education. Too often what I'm told when I share phonograms and rules is reading experts need that. Well, yes, they do, <laughs> but everybody needs it, and everybody is capable of learning it. So it's only when a majority of people know how English really works that will reverse the literacy crisis. We can say on and on and on that we want to change it without teaching the language, but until we teach our own language, we're going to struggle. I really believe that. So let's go on to fluency. Fluency is a huge issue. And you'll notice I've put it like the mortar in this wall because fluency really is automaticity. It's being able to do something quickly. It's being able to read words without 
sounding them out sound by sound to do it fluently. So fluency is the mastery of the skill of decoding or encoding to the point of automaticity so that the student does not need to think about each word, but rather can then focus on the higher level concepts. So how do we build fluency? Now, with fluency and foundations, we build it, once again, through fun games. We began, this is a game where they began actually just blending consonants. Many, many, many kids struggle with consonant blends. So rather than working on blending whole words, we're just going to put b o down, and they're going to play a game, practice blending. We then practice with words. This is reading basketball. Kids beg to play this game. And now they're going to be blending whole words so they can get it down. They're going to move then to sentences and phrases. And yes, we pay a lot of attention to the high-frequency words, but we teach them only after they've learned the rules and phonograms that they need to decode them and understand them. And once they have those rules, then we practice them through games because when they master these high frequency words, they have 50 to 60% of the text and they have the skills now becoming fluent to read lots, thousands of other words. So fluency is developing that and that's through games. Once again, easily played with tutors. Then we need to also focus on comprehension skills. And what's a little bit false of portraying this like a foundation of a wall is it really does grow more like a tree. Because as the roots grow deeper, this grows higher, and we do it simultaneously. But comprehension skills are practiced both in readers. We brought some samples here of them. And one of the unique things about our early readers is, um, well, actually, one of the unique things about us is as we've surveyed schools, is the kids' workbooks have all their readers in the back. They tear them out and they bring them home because we do want to surround kids with literature. And this is a way that we can do that. And the, but the early readers um, actually come with no pictures in them. The kids have to read them and then glue in the pictures so that they actually have to read and comprehend to create their reader. Because at this stage, many kids just picture read, don't they? And we want them to learn that reading is about words and to be successful. There's also a lot of reading games that they play at this level. In um, the next level, they begin to have short sentences. And once again, no sight words here. Everything is understood. And as they understand it, they can move forward. And uh, with this level two, we begin to teach um, finding the main character, finding what is the story about, retelling, personification. They're all fiction stories. And level C, which is here as well for you to see, they are all um, nonfiction readers, STEM readers, and multicultural readers. And here, kids start to learn to highlight the main idea on the page. They start to learn how is the text related to the picture and all the other comprehension skills that we've been doing a pretty good job teaching. I think this is one of the areas we do a good job right now in our schools teaching. But we also do that, but within the context of them growing in the language. There's also fun games like this, and kids love it, where we have a lot of um, activities where it's not just reading books, where here they're going to map out what happened during this ball game. So Sam has the ball, they have to find Sam. Sam will kick the ball to Tom, they'll draw a line to Tom. And kids love this sort of thing because they're now using their reading for creative and other purposes. The next strand of reading, comp uh, reading, successful teaching of reading is vocabulary development. And we touched on that a bit with morphology and that is interwoven throughout these lessons. There are vocabulary tips on the sides. There's ideas on teaching compound words and developing vocabulary. It is interwoven throughout. And all of this, when taught together, leads to reading with comprehension. Now, just a few more statements, and then I'm going to turn it over to Debbie. In most of our schools, we think of language arts education as about eight or more different subjects, don't we? We think grammar, spelling, handwriting, vocabulary, composition, phonics, reading comprehension, fluency, all divided up. Teachers are kind of frantic to get them all in. They are trying to figure out how they're related. A lot of kids and teachers complain that this program doesn't seem to relate to this one. They're teaching different things or from a different perspective. But with logic of English, we see language as a whole. These are all part of a whole. And so they're all interwoven. So when you're teaching spelling, it's reinforcing phonics because they're the same thing, right? Just in reverse. When we're teaching handwriting, we're reinforcing spelling and phonics because we can teach the sounds. 
when we're teaching comprehension, we can still refer to the phonograms if they misread a word because now they have the tools to understand that word. So we're interweaving it all as a whole. And what happens when we teach this way? So I didn't come up with this on my own, by the way. This isn't like Denise invented this great new way to teach reading. This is really based on the research. And in your folder, you have a um, summary, a lit review of the research, but I want to highlight just a couple of points. First of all, um, one of the things that astounded me the most was the functional MRI research that's been happening at Yale, at SMU University, and other major institutions around the country. And what they've shown is that struggling readers read with the front right side of their brain, and strong readers read with the back left side of their brain. And so you think, well, there it is. There's something organically different between strong readers and struggling readers, right? But what they've also shown is when you teach kids systematically how the language works, in 80 hours of instruction, you can bring those kids from non-readers to reading and their brain on an MRI goes from looking like a struggling reader to a strong reader. There are about 2% of the population who do not change from what I've heard from some of the researchers. Those kids have true learning disabilities. Can you imagine 80 hours? Is that very much? And if we look at this um, in context, too, of longitudinal research that's been done, this was shared um, at a conference I was at not too long ago, of longitudinal studies, thousands of students. Here are the names of the researchers, the hours of instruction, the number of students in those groups reading below the 30th percentile, and the number of students reading below the 30th percentile after instruction. Do you notice some of those groups went down to 4%, 1% in, what, 80, 90 hours of instruction? This is possible, and the research tells us again and again. So what is happening with foundations? Foundations is brand new curriculum, and I wish I could tell you we have tons of great research studies out there, but you know what, this came out this spring. So oh, just a minute. This is a school in Minnesota who is piloting us. And we took their Dibbles scores. Are you familiar with Dibbles? And this is a kindergarten class. These are their percentile rankings before instruction. So obviously, this charter school has, you know, kind of a bulge higher than 50%, and they have quite a few students above the 50th percentile coming in. But there are some students down here. There were 15 students in this group on the Dibbles test who knew zero letter, first letter sounds. So it's not a completely uncommon group. Does that make sense? There are kids down here. This is them in December, according to the percentile rankings. And I need to tell you something. The study, or the grant organization for them, requested that they give this test in December but this percentile ranking is compared to the end of semester, which would be this week. So do you see the movement in these kids? And what's a little bit weird about these graphs is we now have, I think, 18 students in the 99th percentile. And the number one predictor, it's thought, with young children in literacy is phonemic awareness, and I just about dropped when I saw these. This is their phonemic awareness scores. And with Dibbles, you do not measure phonemic awareness at the beginning of kindergarten. We have 32 out of 65 kindergarteners in the 99th percentile of phonemic awareness. And I can't tell you, I'm really excited about it because I think we're making a difference and the teachers are ecstatic. You'll also notice we have three students at the 30th percentile or below. So I cannot wait to see what happens this spring with these kids. And we are hearing that the gifted kids, the average kids, the kids who came in who were struggling are all growing and making progress. And I need to tell you, this school did not have any training. They managed to get the grant the week school started. They got the books the second week school started. They had zero training and um, they don't have volunteer support. So imagine what you can do with training and support and planning ahead of time. And the program came in because their kindergarten teachers found it and they advocated and nagged and advocated.